says that we shall be like him. And that's the time and moment and place that we shall be made like him. A couple of backup scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, twinkling an eye at the last trump. Go back up to the verse that we just read. Now, we'll, in my personal theology, remember, I am a proponent of Paul being the apostle to the Gentiles, that only through his writings does the body of Christ get their doctrine and their theology. If that is th true, do not confuse this trump with the trump in Revelations. Two different things. One is for the body of Christ. The other is for Jews. Behold, I show you a mystery. Going back to 1 Corinthians 15. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Moment twinkling an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. When the dead are raised, they are raised automatically incorruptible. Amen. And we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption. For this mortal must put on immortality. If it must, you got to know when. This is a moment in which that happens. 2 Corinthians. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, talking about our body, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heaven. Where is our destination? The heavens. 1 Corinthians 2. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom of which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Yeah. All of this was the hidden wisdom of God. The New Testament clearly teaches both the gospel according to prophecy, that's the kingdom gospel, and the gospel according to the mystery. Right division allowed God's word to say what it means and mean what it says. Understanding Paul's unique apostleship and message allows the Bible to teach what the literal sense of the words clearly indicate. Amen. Which is what? A message of faith plus works to the Jews in keeping with their earthly prophetic program under the dispensation of the law. And a message of faith alone to everyone today in keeping with the heavenly mystery program under the dispensation of grace. So under the dispensation of the law, you have a earthly prophetic program tied to the Jews. Under the new dispensation of grace that we live under, you have a heavenly mystery program that was revealed, revealed to and through Paul under the dispensation of grace. So, two Gospels? Yes, two Gospels. But why do we need two Gospels? Again, we have to understand, you know, why does God need two Gospels? Not that we need it. Why does God need two Gospels? Actually, if, if you get down to it, there are a lot more than two in the Bible. But we're discussing the main two. Noah's Gospel, the good news, what was he told? Build a big boat, you'll be saved. He believed God. 
that was his that was his gospel for his day. Build a big boat and you'll be saved. Just like Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3 to Abram, believe my words and you'll become a great nation. That was the gospel for him. Uh, Paul and the 12 were not, could not have been preaching the same thing. Let's examine three verses of scripture in order to nail this down securely. All right. I want to show you a little bit of how all of us make errors and how all of us have succumbed to errors according to, in a lot of cases, the Bible we use. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a King James Bible. Some churches go, go that far. You do have to understand what the King James says, even though you use and quote other verses out of other translations. But you first have to understand and get scripture reference from different, if you're going to use something different, you have, you have to understand why it is important, and I'm going to attempt to do that. Uh, <coughs> let's look at Jen at the bottom of page 37. Genesis 2, 7 through 9. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circum... Let me start over. But contrary wise, when they saw the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, and the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto Peter, for he was wrought effectively in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me and Barnabas, the right hand of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So you see that the 12 went to the circumcision. Paul went to the uncircumcision. Now, as I've mentioned before, I take the Bible literally. Any and wherever possible before I take it allegorically. If we allow the words to say what they mean and mean what they say, <clears throat> there are two different, there are two distinct gospel messages contained within these verses. How different is the circumcision from the uncircumcision? I think we all know that it's totally different. The Jews were God's chosen people and everyone else was not. That's, all, that's about as different as people can get. Error comes sometimes from the Bible we may have been using for years. What difference is, if any, do you recognize between these three verses and the verse that I just read? So I quoted Galatians 2, 7 through 9 out of the King James. Galatians 2, Seven from the NIV. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to.
to the circumcised. Galatians 2, 7 in the New American Standard. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. Galatians 2 in the Revised Standard. But on the contrary, when they saw that, that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcision, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. Those three verses, what's the difference between those three verses and the King James verse? Go back to page 37. Bottom of page, starting with Galatians 2, 7. But contrary wise, <clears throat> when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. What does that tell you? Two different gospels. Huh? Two different gospels. Two different gospels. The gospel of the uncircumcision and the gospel of the circumcision. Go back to page 38. In the three verses I quoted... On the con start with the NIV, on the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to these uncircumcision, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. I'm trying to make it sound like the same gospel mm -hmm. there. Same gospel to two, two different people. Right. All three of those verses change off to two change two Gospels to one Gospel. Mm -hmm. Interesting to see what the Hebrew says. Huh? Interesting to see what the Hebrew Bible says. So, in the middle of page 38, is Ted dog the same as not Ted dog? Of course not. There was a specific Gospel message of each as Ted's dog is specific to Ted. Things that are different cannot possibly be the same. We must pursue sound doctrine, and that's the grace gospel. Again, we got to pursue rightly dividing the word. Again, to me, words have meanings, and we must stick with the literal interpretation of the word. Another example, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ living in, liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Whose faith is that? Jesus. As his faith mm -hmm. and gave to me. And it says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Meaning his faith, a grace salvation, a non work salvation. Galatians 2.20 in the NIV. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of in the Son of God. What does that make that? Something about you. It puts a responsibility on me. Mm -hmm. It's how much faith I have. Where do you think people got the information? Well, if you just had enough faith, you'd be healed. It starts from where you first understand the gospel. 
if we understand the gospel that it's always been his faith and not my faith, I'm not going to tell Mark, well, Mark, you wouldn't have a problem if you had enough faith. It's changing the gospel from grace to me with intent to a works gospel. Mm -hmm. Both of these examples I gave. It's going from two gospels to one gospel. Confusion because you're binding them together. It's going from his faith to my faith. That doesn't work. Uh, Galatians 2.20, bottom of page 38 in RSV. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the faith, faith, I live by the faith in the Son of God. So am I... Now, what is proclaimed from the pulpit? Pulpit. Put your faith in Jesus. Right? I don't think there's anybody in here that hadn't heard, heard that proclaimed preached. Put your faith in Jesus. Reverse it. Huh? Reverse it. Put Jesus' faith in me. That's it. <laughs> what are we doing? We're preaching the wrong gospel. And people don't like to be told they're preaching the wrong gospel or believing the wrong gospel or hearing the wrong gospel. I understand that. I didn't like myself for a while. Uh, who like, You know, totally different. Totally different. Go to the top of page 39. It is not the strength of our faith that saves us. Amen. See, if I, if evangelists tell me, come forward, come to the altar, put your faith in Jesus. Well, dude, I don't have any faith. Which is right. Do we have faith? I know the first thing that's going to be mentioned is in the gospel, Jesus said everybody's been given a measure of faith. Amen. We do not have and cannot generate divine faith. What does Romans tell us? The author and finisher, and finisher what? The beginning and the end of your faith and my faith is Jesus. Amen. He's the author. So I don't have any. I can't put my faith in Jesus if I don't have any. He is the author and finisher. He is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is our faith. I live by the faith of the Son of God. His faith lives to me. I don't live one of the most egregious altar calls there is to me. It's come make Jesus the Lord of your life. And that will... Again, have people disagree, that's fine. Study it out. That's not salvation. Where's the cross? Where's the blood? Where's his faith? It says, come make Jesus the Lord of your life. Who's it about? It's about me. You come, you make Jesus the Lord of your life. Does it sound good? Fantastic. Is it sound religious? Greatly. 
Is it doctrinal and good theology? It's terrible. Because it gives people a false sense that they have been saved. When, the, when we put it on us, come make Jesus the Lord of your life. I can't. I've got to have his faith. Amen. Top of page 39. It is not the strength of our faith that saves us. It is the faith of Christ to the will of the Father which does. <coughs> we must simply believe and trust in what Christ did on our behalf. 1 Corinthians 15.22 for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. If you are still a son of Adam, you die. So how important are messages like this? Life and death. Without Christ, you die. Have you been adopted as a son of God? Why? Why? Why is that important? Because you were born a son of Adam. Amen. Simply believe in what Christ did, and you'll be saved. It's that simple. Stop trusting in ourself and trust in Christ alone. So as the Jewish believers were baptized with water and baptized by Christ with the Spirit, all right, that was the baptism of Jewish believers. They were baptized with water and baptized by Christ with the Spirit, whose power demonstrated itself through them. We are baptized by the Spirit into Christ's body. Totally different. which is the one true church. Note it is not a denomination. The true church is not a denomination. We are never saved by good works. We are saved unto good works. Amen. Just because a thing is not popular, popularly known does not preclude it from being true. The simple and most basic fact truth is not taught in denominational churches as the implications are more than profound. The simple truth of the two gospels, prophetic and mystery, is the absolute key to Bible understanding. Unless you can see, and the reason I say that, unless we see the difference between the two gospels, we will not rightly divide the word and see that our word comes from Paul and that our doctrine comes from Christ through Paul's mystery gospel. And we will continue to mix. Let's start over again. Just because a thing is not popularly known does not preclude it from being true. This simple and most basic fact, basic biblical truth is not taught in churches as the implications are more than profound. Simple truth of the two gospels, prophetic and mystery, is the absolute key to understanding the Bible. Denominational churches not understanding or acknowledging the mystery kept secret since the world began. You can understand it, but if you don't acknowledge it out of fear, then something's wrong. Teach that Peter and Paul preached the same thing to two different groups of people. Check these verses in any other Bible you may have in your possession. Nearly everyone and all modern translations or perversions reduce the specific intent 
Paul had for writing the verses. When you change the meaning of the verses, you are changing the intent which the Holy Spirit gave Paul the reason to write the verses to start with. Amen. And combine them into one single kingdom gospel message preached unto two groups of people as if both groups are to follow the same instructions from God. King James maintains Paul's literal meaning, that is, a specific gospel, good news, message was given to him that he could give to the uncircumcision, the heathen, and a specific gospel, the good news message that was given to Peter, that the twelve could give to the circumcision. Both gospels were delivered to each man, Peter and Paul, by Jesus Christ. To Peter, during Christ's earthly ministry to Israel, <clears throat> and to Paul from Christ's heavenly ministry, as he currently as he is currently seated at his father's right hand. The Holy Spirit gave Paul specific language and words to use to bring out the intent that the Holy Spirit had for the message that he wanted Paul to proclaim. If we start confusing the intent of the Holy Spirit, changing his intent, to make it indistinguishable between two Gospels and just combine them into one. We are messing with the intent of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's not good ground to be on. 